brothers and sisters, hear, believe, accept the good news. By the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you and for me on Calvary, our sins are indeed forgiven. Amen. All right. Hey, uh, we are closing out our Luke sermon or now. We're going to be in Luke for the rest of the year. We're closing out Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain or the Beatitudes today. And as you remember, these teachings represent the core. The Beatitudes or or the Sermon on the Mount represents the core of the teachings of Jesus. And then the rest of the gospel fleshes out the meaning of this core teaching, right? Now, in one of the most misunderstood verses in all of the scripture last week, uh, where Jesus said, do not judge. I mean, how hard is that to understand? It's just three words. It's in plain English. Do not judge. How hard is that? And yet, when we read that in context, because when you, whenever you pull out a verse out of context, it's dangerous. Because pulled out of context, do not judge would mean, hey, Christians, don't make any discernment or dis- don't make any distinction between good and evil. Who are you to judge what is good, what is evil? Hey, you Christians, disciples, don't determine what is, what is sinful and what is good. I mean, so read out of context, it would sound like Christians are to make no judgments whatsoever. But Jesus is absolutely not saying Don't discern between good and evil. Don't make judgments about what is right and what is wrong. Because if Jesus were actually saying that, he would contradict all of Scripture. Where where all of Scripture is like, get wisdom, get understanding. You disciples, you be able to discern between good and evil. That's what maturing people do. And so, read out of context, it's total misreading of that text. Read out of context, when we read that verse in context, we recognize, of course, Jesus is saying, discern between good and evil and right and wrong. What Jesus is against is judgmental, condemning spirit. A judgmental, condemning spirit is when you see people in the worst light possible, when you attach motives to actions that were never there. So Jesus is saying, don't do that. And so today's text, verses 43 to 45, shows us how Jesus wants disciples to go about making discernment about what is good and wrong. How do we make judgments about people? And Jesus says, you base it on two things. You base your judgment regarding people. And he wants Christians to make good, wise judgments about people based on these two things. Verses 43 to 45. We read, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick up pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so what Jesus tells us, the two criteria by which you judge people, you judge the character, the moral character of people, is based on fruit or deeds, actions, And then you judge people based on the words they speak. Those are the two things. Whatever and whatever's in the heart, 
whatever's in the core of who we are, expresses itself manifestly, outwardly, in both deeds or fruits and words. What's inside a person shows up on the outside in our actions and our words. Now, one of the problems with this text is that we modern readers hear the word heart. Whatever's in the heart is expressed in our deeds and our words. Heart for us means place of emotion, place of you know, love and feelings and emotions. The heart did not mean that in the ancient world. The heart, think, whenever you come across the word heart in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you think brain. Whatever we think of the brain, the place of will, decision-making, discerning, that was the heart for the ancient world. So whenever they say, you know, whatever's in the heart expresses itself, it's talking about your decision-making, where the location of your desires or dreams, the place of wisdom and discernment, that was the heart. And so whatever's there, at the core of who we are and how we make decisions expresses itself in deeds and in words. Deeds absolutely make judgments regarding people's decision-making. I mean, how else, how else are we to judge people besides their actions, right? Whatever you're doing, that's who you are. Your deeds and as you are looking at people's deeds, Christians, here are the questions you want to be asking. Are they builders or are they ones who destroy? Do they encourage growth and make people better wherever they show up? Or do they destroy people and make people bitter wherever they show up? You know, there are some people where, where they show up and just by their mere presence just makes everyone feel better. Because whatever comes out of their mouths, and whatever they do, they build up people, and everything starts feeling better. And then there's some people who show up, and then things just tank. Things turn negative, and instead of building people up, instead of building trust, they start destroying trust. They start destroying community. Are they builder-uppers, or are they tear-downers? One is good, one is evil. They're not the same. And you Christians, you got to make a discernment there. And as you are looking at them, look at their past history. Have they built anything? Are they, have they done anything? Who have they encouraged? What have they built? And do they encourage you when, when they show up? And here's a telltale sign of a teardowner. Whenever you hear them speaking about other people, and if their speech and their tends to be speaking poorly of others, and planting seeds of distrust in others, guaranteed when you're not around, they're speaking poorly about you. Guaranteed. Are they about building up the kingdom, building up God's church, or are they about their own kingdom? Look at the relationships around the person. Are they builder-uppers or tear-downers? Absolutely be discerning, 100% make judgments about people based on their deeds. And then the second thing that Jesus says is look at their words. Nothing shows the state of our hearts as well as our spoken words. Being a follower of Jesus has to change our speech. It has to change the way we talk because Jesus owns your tongue. The way we speak cannot be the way everyone else speaks. And it's not just about spoken, uttered words, because, you know, I'm a whole lot better about controlling my uttered words, but there's a lot of words I think in here about myself and about other people that I would never utter out there. But 
those count too. God says in James chapter 1, verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their faith is worthless. Words matter. What words are coming out of a person's mouth? Because whatever is here comes out through your words. So if our speech is carnal, you are carnal. If our speech is worldly, we are worldly. If our speech is godless, we are godless. If it is profane, we are profane. If our speech is mean, we are mean. If it is crude, we are crude. And if our speech is devoid of Christ, we are devoid of Christ. I mean, how else are we supposed to be discerning about people unless we look at their deeds, what they do, and what they say? So absolutely take a look at what people are saying and what people are doing. Disciples judge, discern by examining the fruits and the words of others. Absolutely be discerning. All right, and then we move to the closing of the Beatitudes. All right, so I told you guys, uh, we've been now studying the Beatitudes for like four, five weeks. This represents the core teaching of Jesus, right? The Beatitudes. Well, this next section represents the core of the core. This is what it comes down to. Jesus says, look, all the stuff I'm going to talk about, all the stuff that I talked about in the Beatitudes, it all comes down to this one thing. If you don't do this one thing, none of it matters. All right? So what's this one thing? Well, verses 46 through 49. And both Luke and Matthew close out their gospel or the Beatitudes with this section. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Every, for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them in practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid the foundation upon the rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. The core of the core is this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I command? Because if you, if you really understood what Lord means, if you have a Lord, and the Lord commands you to do something, you obey. There is no such thing as Lord, and then you say, Nah. That's an impossibility. So Jesus asked, look, of all the stuff I'm telling you, of all the stuff I'm telling you, if you're not going to do what I command, what the heck is the point? What is the point of all this teaching if you don't do what I command? And if we are disciples, and the terms here, so Jesus says, look, look at the word Lord. That means if Lord, the Lord, capital L, Lord, tells you something, you obey. And then you're a disciple. You know what a disciple literally means? A learner, a follower. You know what Christian literally means? Followers of Christ. That's what a Christian is. Christ I-A-N, Ian, is a follower, plural, followers of Christ. And so if you're following Christ, if you're a disciple, a learner, and a follower of Christ, if Jesus says, does, and thinks something, followers ought to look the same, right? 
If Jesus does this, and if you're following, that's where you go, and that's what you do. That's what a follower is. And to be a follower and a Christian and to disobey is an impossibility. Let me just give you a few verses from one book in the Bible, John, about this relationship between following Christ or Lord, Master, and then Disciple. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. John 14, 21, The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. John 14, 24, The one who doesn't love me does not keep my commands. John 15, 10, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. The word of our Lord, obedience. They have to go together. And Matthew fills out our version or what Jesus taught there even more in Matthew's version in Matthew 7. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, look, on the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? You know who these guys are? Teachers, preachers. In the church. Hey, hello, uh, Pastor James. Uh, I preached that little church for like a decade plus. Going on the second day, hello, remember me. And then, did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal in your name? And you know who Jesus is talking about is not just church going folk, but church leaders. Hey, remember, I was an elder. I was ordained, Jesus. I'm an ordained deacon. Hey, I led a small group. I, I served in the church. And Jesus will say to them, I Never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So what in the world does Jesus mean? I never knew you. Of course, Jesus knows my identity. Jesus knows who you are. Or every name that's ever been put together and created, every person, God knows who they are. So what does Jesus mean? I never knew you. Because all our names are written in the book of life or they're not. So God knows everyone. So what in the world do you mean I never knew you? It doesn't mean Jesus does not know James Kim. What Jesus means is that, hey, I never knew you as a follower. Because you didn't follow. A disciple follows. But I never knew you to be a follower. I never knew you as Lord. Because if the Lord commands, and if all this stuff Jesus commands, then what do followers do? They obey, right? And so what Jesus is saying, look, I never knew you as a disciple, a follower. You chose your kingdom, but it wasn't my kingdom. Because 
even in your serving, even in your teaching, even in your proclamation, even in your healing and demon casting, it was all about you. It was all about what I want, what I think, what I prefer. It was about your kingdom. It was never about mine where you make disciples and grow disciples. Why? To share my love with all people. It was never about that. It was always about you. So I never knew you. Out of all the passages, goodness gracious, if this doesn't scare you, you dead. So whose kingdom are we pursuing? Is it about what I want, what I think? What I prefer? Or is it just fully submitting, saying, hey, all yours, Jesus. Your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know, here's the thing. This parable, this this saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I command? And then the parable, the wise Builder and the foolish builder. You know what the only difference between the wise and the foolish builder is? Both the wise and the foolish confess Jesus as Lord. Did you get that? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I command? And I'll tell you what the wise are like. They hear my word and put them in practice. That's the wise. And what's the unwise or the foolish? The one who hears my word and does not put them into practice. And so it's not about confession. It's not about saying, Lord, Lord. Both of them confess Jesus as Lord. Both of them know that. The only difference between the wise and the foolish is obedience. One has it, one does not. And that, you see, is the difference between information and transformation. Here's the difference. Here, it's huge. God says in James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And then it continues in James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that there's one God good. Even the demons believe. The difference between information and transformation is obedience. See, if it's just, if you read this word as information, oh, Jesus died on the cross? That's nice. Oh, God rescued the people of Israel from slavery? Oh, how interesting. Oh, that's the way the Israelites conquered back the promised land? Oh, how interesting. Information, you could take it or leave it, and it never leads to transformation. When you read this word as God's word, and it transforms you, you know what the only difference between information and transformation is? Obedience. If you read God's word and you obey and put it into action... You know what happens? The result? Transformation. Change. You know how you change? You obey. If you don't obey, you don't change. You just got more information. And so the only difference between reading God's word as information, how interesting, to reading God's word to transform, is you got to obey. If you obey what God says, hey, You're different today than you were the day before. You know why? Because you obeyed. You take obedience out, there's no transformation. It's just information. And when it comes to information, Jesus is like, dude, even the demons believe. Never change that. So what does it mean to be a follower? What does it mean to be a disciple? Dude, follow. If you're going to follow me, follow. Because if you don't follow, you're not a follower. And then Jesus tells us, closes out with three traits of disciples. Did you catch that? The wise are, 
as for everyone who comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. Three things. Comes to Jesus, hears his words, and then does them. That's the three ingredients of discipleship. you got to come to Jesus, not just for in- entertainment, not just for information. You come to Jesus. You seek him out as if your life depended on it. You go to God's word and you seek him out because you say, God, I desperately need your truth today. So show me your truth, not just for information, not just for entertainment, so you can obey it. If God gives you the secret to the kingdom and you don't do it, then what's the point? That's exactly the point. You got to come to Jesus. Second, you got to hear Jesus' word. And this is an act of listening. You got to hear Jesus' word. So you coming to church on Sundays, hearing God's word preach is non-negotiable. You got to listen to God's word. And so here's some practical steps you can do to do active listening. Number one, pray for your preacher. That matters. Pray for your preacher. And here's what you're praying for. God, make sure that dude preaches your word, right? Because what's the point if the preacher's just thinking, telling you his thoughts, her thoughts? So you got to pray for the preacher. God, make him preach your word. And then secondly, pray. God, make sure he or she has faithfully prepared. Because that matters. Secondly, pray for yourself. God, help me to be open to whatever it is you might be telling me that I would obey. Pray for yourself. Come prepared. And then, you know, we have the Bible verses up there, but I want you to get into the habit of whenever someone's preaching, to keep your Bibles open. Have your Bibles open. Have, whether it's on your phone or... Yeah, it's back there. So, And here's the reason why that's so important. Make sure whatever the preacher person is preaching is in there. Hey, dude, I don't know where you're getting that from. It's not in here. Then that's a problem, right? So keep your Bibles open. And then finally, take some notes. Because we forget. And even when I take notes, I forget. i got to keep reviewing my notes. And that's the point. Take some notes. Review them. And then finally, put them into practice. That's the whole crux, right? That's what Jesus is saying. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? you got to do what I say. And here's what, here's what I've discovered. It's so easy to be a Christian... To act like, think like, do like a Christian at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Because here, I don't even think cuss words. But boy, when I'm on the golf course and my ball slices like crazy and goes out of bounds and hits a house, I may not utter cuss words. Because Jim Pledger, one of our elders, always plays with me. So I got to watch what I say. But golly, you ought to hear the words in here. It's so easy to be Christian in church. But where Christ following really happens is when you're miles away from church. And you're at home. You're surfing the internet. You're at work. You're at play. So are you following Christ at home, work, when you're at play? Because if there's inconsistencies there, who are you following? All right, let me close with this final thought. You all were given a note card, right? Take out your note card. Everyone take out a note card. And on that note card, I want you to just write two words, two words. 
I want you to write the words no, N-O, and the word Lord. See that? Okay, I once heard a preacher illustrate this passage in this way. He said, look, these two words cannot coexist. They're an impossibility. If you understand the word no, you have to cross out Lord. Because you can't have these two words coexisting. They're an impossibility. If you say Lord, you have to cross out the word no. You can't have both coexisting. They're simply impossible. One cancels the other out. It's an impossibility. You can't have both. If you understand the word Lord, God, you are God, you are King, you are Lord, you are Master, you are Savior. If you understand that, you can't ever say to God, Lord, Savior, King, no. You can't do it. It's an impossibility. If you say, Lord, you have to cross out no. But if there's any place in your life, any area in your life where you're saying, nah, I know what you said about money, but nah, you got to cross out Lord. I know what you said about sexuality and sexual identity, that it's not the core identification of human beings are, that we are first and foremost sons and daughters of God. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. That's our primary identity. But no, you come up with your own definitions. you got to cross out, Lord. They cannot coexist. Whatever it is, whatever it is, if there's any area in your life where you are saying, nah, to Jesus, and you're not submitted when it comes to sexuality, money, Sabbath-keeping, relationships, tithing, marriage, whatever it is, if you are saying no, you got to cross out, Lord, because you don't have one. One of these two has to be crossed out. And if you're a follower, Jesus says, hey, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you're not doing what I command? What is it that you don't get? One of these words in your life has to be crossed out. So which are you, disciple? Who are you following? Let us pray. Hey, God. Thank you for the clarity of your teaching. And then, God, you know, it's not like I don't want to obey you. It's just so dang hard. So God, help me, help us. Because we want to follow you and we want to obey. But God, help us, help us, help us. Because this flesh rages against your truth. So God, help us. Lord, may you find in Lakewood Grace a bunch of followers who do what you command. Because that's all it comes down to. You teach us a bunch of stuff, not for information, not for entertainment but so you can transform us. And we are transformed when we obey. So God, help us to keep crossing out no 
in our life when it comes to you. We obey. In Jesus' name, amen.